This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and today we're going to look at one of the affordable full-frame digital SLR cameras on the market. This is the Canon EOS 6D. It is $1,400 less than the Canon 5D Mark III, but you get just about everything that's good in there for a lot less money. It's also very different from the camera that we looked at a week or two ago, which was the Sony RX10, a sort of professional bridge camera that had a permanently attached lens. This one is traditional removable lens. All the heavy-duty features you'd expect from a digital SLR camera at the higher end and we're gonna see is that full frame worth it we're gonna look at it now so this is the Canon EOS 6D this is a dream come true for a lot of photographers who've been waiting for an affordable relatively speaking full frame digital SLR camera full frame means the sensor size is as big as 35 millimeter film compared to an APS-C size sensor, and that's what you see in most consumer digital SLRs, you're looking at about one and a half times the sensor size here, and compared to Micro Four Thirds, the difference is even bigger. So bigger sensor size means, well, it can collect more image data. Also, it can collect more light. Think of it like a solar panel. A bigger solar panel can potentially collect more light overall. Now, on any given point on the sensor that's inside of here, of course, you can only collect so much light. It's not that any given point is brighter, but it's just overall you're collecting more light on that sensor size. And to show you what we mean in terms of sensor size, now with point and shoot cameras, we can't show you because the lens doesn't come off. Even the Sony RX10 we recently reviewed, that camera lens is permanently attached, but we'll show you compared to an APS C size sensor. Here we have the Sony Alpha 65, which is a pretty decent mid range APS C size sensor digital camera. Now it's fairly compact. Sony's Alphas are. They're mirrorless, so there's no pentaprism, no mirror up there going on. But you can see the difference in size, and also there's a significant difference in weight, which has something also to do, of course, with whatever lens you've got attached on there. But you get the difference in body size there. So we're going to take off the lenses and show you the sensor inside. Sensor you know you like to keep those clean so keep that in mind don't leave these open like this all the time do not stick your finger on the sensor do not let your dog lick the sensor those would all be very bad things so inside we've got the mirror shooting up at the sensor here this is a mirrorless design so you won't see quite the same thing but there's the difference on the internals so again, the real important thing is going to be the image quality difference you get with the bigger sensor. You know, if you're only shooting things for Facebook, really small web images, it's not going to make all that much of a difference. You would think, right? Aha. Uh -huh. But it does. Because this guy with the larger sensor actually manages to get better colors too and better contrast. So even if you're not making really large pictures, you're not making posters, for example, or any kind of big blow up situation like that, you can still appreciate the full frame because it's just giving you better image quality. Also, you get better depth of field. Letting more light in means better depth of field. That's all trendy right now in video as well as always in still photos. And that means background blur. Or the more interesting cases, you're shooting a portrait shot and you have a person sandwiched between two objects. This person in the middle can be in focus, the other two are blurred. So it really brings attention to whatever it is that is element of interest in your picture. So that's why you should care about full frame in case you're wondering and you're watching this not really knowing much about that. For those of you who do know, you get it already. Full frame is kind of, well, everything that we could ever hope for unless you're really getting hardcore and you're going to a medium format film camera. Not many people doing that anymore. And while we're talking about sizes, for those of you who say, I, I'm sure I want a full frame camera, but boy, I really hate just how heavy, you know, this is the body alone is almost two pounds. This is the Sony Alpha 7 or A7 camera. This is the smallest full frame digital SLR interchangeable lens camera. It's not really an SLR because it doesn't have a single lens reflex. It doesn't have a mirror inside. It's a mirrorless camera, but Difference in size, difference in weight, very obvious. And we're going to have a review of the A7 too. So if you're interested in that, hold on. You'll find out about that soon enough. Now here they are, nose on nose. Both of these are with their kit lenses. If you get them with the kit lenses, with the, with the Sony, again, wait for a review, but I'll tell you, the kit lens is meh. But on the Canon, ha. Huh. This kit lens is wonderful. It's amazing. This is a Canon L lens. For those of you who know Canon cameras, you know that's their high-end line of lenses, the better ones. That's really refreshing because even sometimes with higher-end digital SLR cameras, to keep the bundles cheap, they give you some really trashy zoom lens that 
just is going to make you think that your camera that you paid so much for is kind of mediocre and what the heck is wrong there. Not in the case of this. 24 to 105 millimeter zoom, and this is full frame, so there's no conversion necessary. The numbers are actually the numbers. Constant f4 aperture lens. Very, very good lens. Great color, great contrast, great light collection. Not a small lens, though, of course, Canon has even bigger zoom lenses, so it's not as immense as you might think. It does do the tromboning thing when you zoom pops out like that. It doesn't do, doesn't creep though if I hold it like that. It's not going to fall out, which is good. Anyway, excellent lens really shows off the capabilities of the camera. If you don't already have a, a good zoom lens for your Canon cameras, that some of you are already Canon people and you're just upgrading from APS-C or whatever, highly recommend getting it with the bundle because you're going to save some money, certainly, as you often do with the kit lens. So you can see Autofocus, manual focus, switchable over here. Stabilizer switchable on and off. We got the distance scale up here. Our zoom ring, our focus ring. Very good lens. And you'll, you'll see the photos that I took. Even low light shots, f4 for an aperture is not really that wide, but I got some pretty nice bokeh on this. So it's good enough. I mean, thanks to the large sensor, you can actually pull some bokeh out of even a not very fast lens. So how about the rest of the specs? And how much does this baby actually cost? You know how camera prices are. They can be pretty wild and crazy, especially if you get them from gray market people, suspicious people, or Amazon actually right now has a great price on this camera because they don't have it in stock. So they have other merchants there on the, on the Amazon website that do, but they're actually selling for $19.99 with this lens, which is at a loss. So that is insanely good. If you can get somebody to price match that and you want the camera now, that's your best bet. <laughs> Merchant's going to love you for doing that, but you might be able to. The list price on the body is $18.99. Typically, you'll see it for around $16.50 to $17.25. And the list price on the body plus the lens is $24.99. Again, you've heard how cheap you can find it, especially if you get somebody to price match it on Amazon. You go down to maybe $2,200. That's a pretty good deal. The lens by itself usually sells for around $1,000. So that's quite a good lens. You might find it for $700 because uh, some camera vendors will break apart kits, sell somebody just the body, and then sell the lens separately. But you get an idea what kind of good lens that is. Sony has a 24 megapixel full frame. Okay, Nikon goes a little higher. The difference between 20 and 24 megapixels is irrelevant. It's small enough to not make a difference. Uh, obviously, there are cameras with even higher megapixel sensors right now. And really, unless you are shooting for billboards, you don't need that many pixels. 20 is just fine, so don't worry about that. That's perfectly good. Same Digic 5 image, 5 plus image processor that's used in the Canon EOS 5D Mark III. Like all Canon cameras, it works pretty much the same. So if you know Canon cameras, it's fairly intuitive. You got your control dial here with your different modes that you can shoot in. Little center press button to release it. So that's sort of a more pro feature. A lot of cameras that are a little bit more consumer oriented don't have any kind of lock. So it's easy to accidentally change it. Now you're thinking, if I'm kind of careful, uh, how would that happen? Well, this is meant for people even like us. Today's journalists are also photojournalists running around at trade shows. You've got this thing bouncing off of your own stomach. You've got people bumping into it. Easier to change these dials by accident, you might think, when you're actually in the field. So there's a difference from a consumer camera right there. Your on-off switch here. Again, pretty standard Canon kind of controls going on here. Your menu and your info buttons right there. Diopter adjustment for the absolutely normal optical glass viewfinder. So unlike mirrorless cameras, it's not a digital viewfinder. You're actually seeing in real time what you're looking at, which is always pleasant. The usual informational window up here tells you all you need to know. Drive control, ISO, a couple of other controls are up there. We got the Q button here now, which takes you to some quick settings when you're actually shooting video or still, which is a nice little speedy uppy kind of thing. And the usual control dial over here. So normal stuff, normal hot shoe up top, no flash, no flash. That's right, no flash, see? No. So, here's the thing. Thanks to the full frame sensor gathering lots of light, if you put a pretty good lens on this, a lot of the time you won't need a flash. And again, this is more of a pro-oriented camera. Pros really don't use the built-in flash much. All it does is serve to usually make photos look nasty, unnatural, washed out. So attach a nice Canon Speedlight flash up here when, and if you want the flash, or use external flashes placed about the room. On the back here, we have a one megapixel 
LCD, three inches, very nice. Uh, you know, that's that's not the highest resolution, though. I, I wish they could have done a little bit better, and that's only slightly smaller, by the way, than the 3.2-inch viewfinder on the 5D Mark III. Now, most of the time, you're going to be looking through the eyepiece. Again, uh, us more pro-oriented people rarely use the monitor on the back, and... You know, if you're holding it up at an awkward angle, it can be handy. By the way, this doesn't tilt or move, so it's of limited utility if you're going to be doing something like holding it above everybody's head at a concert or something like that. Anyway, uh, most of the time, really, I use the eyepiece. But if you want to switch to live view, you can just switch right here. And there you go. So you can see what the viewfinder looks like. We've got our Ernie the bath toy right there. Half press to focus. We're leaning on the lens a little bit, so it's having a little hard time. There we go. And, by the way, if you want to shoot movie, you just hit start, stop right there. It's that easy. Uh -huh. Now, just like most, most digital SLR cameras, you can capture some very nice video. By the way, like the 5D, this goes to 30 frames per second. It doesn't do 60p, it doesn't do 60i. If you're shooting action, that's going to be an issue, but otherwise not. You can also do 24p. For those of us who are in America anyway, that's, those are the numbers that we work with. This does not do autofocus when you shoot video, like most digital SLRs. Our dedicated camera person didn't want to cry when using it, and we did shoot our iPad Air versus Samsung Galaxy Tab Pro 10.1 using this, so you can see what video footage looks like, and that's pretty challenging too. Shooting tablets with glassy displays, lots of reflection is hard. You can see it looks quite nice, full HD. The Sony RX10 we reviewed really came just about as close, though, which is pretty amazing. Anyway, part of the challenge here is if you're operating the zoom on this and you're trying to also manually focus, it can be kind of crazy making. Now you can do an initial autofocus, press halfway to focus, and if you do that with it zoomed all the way out, when you pull back in, it'll generally speaking stay in focus, but get used to the fact you're going to have to pull focus on this. In terms of the, the video quality, it, it's right up there with the 5D Mark III. And again, you're saving yourself a whole lot of money with this guy, too. So now we're shooting our Sony Alpha 7. Very fast. Requires focus quickly. And if we pan our video camera over, you can see where the Sony is sitting that close. So that's what it's focusing on. So very quick focus. Very nice there. 11-point autofocus. That, you know, in a numbers crazed society, that's not an, a lot of autofocus points. In experience and use, actually, it's just fine. I have no problems whatsoever, obviously, with this autofocus. Landscapes, flower macros, all that stuff works fine. But if you get the 5D Mark III, you get 61 autofocus points. For those of you who are doing action and sports photography, that's going to make a difference, or even videography. Then you're going to care about that. So I'm not going to say it's unimportant, but uh, for those of you who are not doing a lot of sports and action photography, plenty of autofocus points. Does quite a good job. Okay, video snobs, you're going to be happy. This does not shoot AVC HD. You know, it's funny how codecs get old and die these days, and everybody is, just hates AVC HD. Who's seriously into video lately because they want less lossy, higher quality formats. So this shoots in the move h.264 format so you can get better quality video out of this the drawback is you definitely want a more powerful computer to actually process those files and we'll get into the two versions of that in a minute but you can shoot in say in standard compression mode which is what we're talking about here because i think most people are going to use that and i noticed that with imovie and final cut pro the import times and transcoding time that it does at the same time is about three to four times longer than AVC HD. So keep that in mind. For those of you who need to run and gun and process footage quickly who are shooting video, it's going to take you some more time there. That is with the IPB, which is the standard compression method. Canon also has their all eye compression that uses much, much, much more space, like five times as much space and requires a faster card. And you better have a really fast computer if you're going to be working with that footage. Our friend right here has connections that most of us would need. We have our HDMI out right here, mini HDMI. We have the usual AV out port as well. And here we have microphone and we have the remote control jack. There is no headphone jack on here though. So for those of you who like to monitor with headphones, keep that in mind. This side here, we have the SD card slack, slot compatible with ultra high speed cards and SDXC cards. Different from the 5D Mark III, which has both CF and SD cards. You just have SD card here. And, of course, the battery lives in the compartment down here. 
Another difference from the Canon 5D Mark III is this has GPS and Wi-Fi, real popular in consumer cameras right now, not there on the 5D Mark III. Obviously, this is going to be a little bit lighter. I'm not sure. Once you get heavy past a certain point with cameras, it makes much difference. And it's a little bit smaller. Maybe you can tell the difference. You're a better judge than I am of how you feel the weight difference. But once you're looking at two and a half pounds of camera versus two and three quarter or three pounds of camera, that's just a lot of camera around your neck and in your hands. Ergonomically, as you'd expect, nice sturdy metal and polycarbonate body, nice grip, very comfortable. Um, for those of you who have nice full-size adult hands like I do, I'm almost six feet tall, I have pretty big hands, this is just so comfy that it feels nice in the hand, it really does. The littler cameras actually just about give you a hand cramp, some of them are so small, so th this feels quite good. There's something to be said sometimes for a larger camera too. So how about picture quality? We're going to show you a whole bunch of pictures that we took and we're going to splice them right in and I can tell you, you're going to feel like a genius. Now, you've seen what I look like, you know I'm not a youngster anymore. I've been shooting since the days of film with cameras, really, honestly. My dad used to let me use his really nice Nikon film cameras. God knows why he trusted me with them, but I've been hooked on cameras since I was about 11 years old. I feel like a genius when I take pictures with this camera. So, it's what you would expect from a full frame camera with high quality lens on it really if you're pretty good at photography you've been taking pictures for years you take a lot of pictures with a pretty nice bridge camera or even some APS-C $500 SLRs and they don't quite come out the way that they would in your mind I find like what I'm thinking in my mind actually happens and I end up with a whole lot of really pretty photos uh, certainly the lens resolves highly, the camera does, it's very sharp. Now if you if you put them right against each other the A7 could even maybe be a little bit sharper uh, in terms of MTF but the the character of the picture is just amazing, the luminosity, I can't think of another word. When you're doing a portrait shot instead of seeing blotchy skin tones because most of us are not perfect what you're going to see is a really nice warm skin tone with just the right amount of, not bloom in the negative sense of photography but uh, just a warmth coming from your subject's face. Shooting orchids, and we're going to slice in some orchid pictures for you. The colors are so bloody vibrant, it's just frightening, and, and skies are so blue. The saturation levels are just amazing, really they are, compared to many cameras, including the Sony A7, the Sony RX10, my old Canon EOS 30D. It's just, wow, nice. And here are the pictures so you can see for yourself. So who's the Canon 64? And we have it next to a very likely yet unlikely little friend here. This is the Sony RX10. Again, technically speaking, a bridge camera, though it has a lot of very professional features and some incredible video shooting. But this lens, which is the equivalent of going zooming out all the way to 200 millimeters, is pretty darn amazing, a very good piece of glass. I think enthusiasts could be interested in both of these. This one as being more portable and having autofocus video. This one for having just superb photo quality and, and if you can pull focus on it, very nice video quality as well. This is for photography enthusiasts, clearly, and for professional photographers, journalists, wedding photographers, any of you, this is going to work out just great. You can count on fast shot times, really very good shots out of the camera with minimal work and processing. You take something like the RX10 and you're talking about the jack of all trades. It has a pretty darn good lens on it. It has very long zoom range. It's light. It's easy to carry. It can shoot video as well. Depends on what you need in the way of a camera. If you're a Canon person, and we haven't brought any Nikon in here before we have any camera wars, but if you're a camera, camera person and a Canon person and you have a bunch of Canon glass, obviously you're going to want to move this way. If you're moving up from a Canon APS-C size sensor digital SLR with crop lenses, if you didn't buy the full frame lenses, you're still going to have to buy more lenses. So keep an open mind. You don't want to use a crop lens on a full frame camera. 
And then in between, we have things like the Sony A7. For those of you where portability really counts, but I can tell you between the two that the Canon 60 has been blowing it away overall with just yummy, yummy looking images. So that's the Canon EOS 6D available now with or without this nice kit lens. Again, if you don't have a zoom lens in this range, I'd say get this kit lens because it's really nice L glass. Is full frame all they make it out to be? My God, yes it is. As you saw from some of the sample images we took and what I've told you, definitely a really excellent camera. And nice, uh, they're relatively speaking now so affordable. They used to be $5,000, $10,000, now around two grand or so. You can get some amazing results. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to read our written review.